It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 256 of Science on Top, live from Aries Inlet. Today is Saturday the 25th of February 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Oncology Clinical Trials Coordinator, currently completing a Master's in Bioethics, Joe Benamou. Hi Ed. And astronomy lover and science geek, Lucas Randall. Hey Ed. And let's begin with some astronomy, because this is really the big story of the week. NASA announced on Thursday the discovery of seven planets, all orbiting the same star and all about Earth size, with three of them firmly located in the habitable zone, uh, the area around the parent star where a rocky planet is most likely to have liquid water, and therefore life. Uh, Lucas, tell us about TRAPPIST-1. I think uh, we can all agree that, that the that NASA and, and indeed the whole sign, or the whole astronomy community are just showing off now. They're, they've you know gone from what was it ninety two when we had the first you know announcements of exoplanets. Um, it's been quite a while. It's been quite a journey. And then last year there was some. There was over a thousand that were discovered in yeah. one hit yeah. last year. That was like let's just double the number of planets. That I we think know we're about. around three thousand known, it, yeah. confirmed exoplanets. So now you know we're getting to the point that it's uh, if if you if you as an adult haven't personally discovered at least <laughs> one exoplanet by now. You really can't sort of lay any claim to I feel being... deficient. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it is getting you know pretty impressive the, the abilities to find uh, to find exoplanets. Can I just ask a question to the audience? Um, who can tell me some of the ways that are used to find exoplanets right now? Show of hands. Yes. Uh, so the transient approach, where you see. The, transit, the, yep. The dimming of the star. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so the transit method where basically you see a dimming in light as the star moves across and just repeating it for the, yep. for the recording. Yep. Yes. The wiggle method. The wiggle method, otherwise known as, do you, do you recall? Yeah, it's a bit of a wobble approach, Doppler, or the Doppler shift, it's all, it's all the same thing. This is where you basically see um, the, uh, it's, uh, this gravitational tug effect on, on the, the parent star by one of its planets or multiple planets that are moving around it. And depending on, on the alignment of that, we might see it as a Doppler shift where you've got uh, a change in the, in the light waves that are coming off this planet where they go you know, in and out from red to blue, as, as the, uh, which is basically this Doppler, Doppler shift. Or we can see just a change in apparent brightness. Um, or a whole lot of other things that they actually use to measure it. So a, a couple of things. Any other ones that people people know about or have heard about? No. So look, there's actually, I mean, all of the others are variations on those things, and and uh, we know quite a lot um, just by observing the apparent brightness of stars. So there's, it's an amazing amount that you can derive from this, and that really is what they were doing here with this latest discovery. The first. Uh, discovery was actually by an earthbound instrument, which is the, the TRAPPIST-1. It's, it's not a, an overly, um, you know, ringing in the ears sort of uh, a name, unfortunately. It's but, surprising um, for NASA. So the host star, which is actually called 2MASS J2306, I'm not going to continue, there's lots of numbers, uh. um, which is from the 2MASS survey. Um, uh, and this survey was specifically looking at quite cool stars, so stars that are not particularly... Um, uh, hot, they're not, not, not uh, putting out a, a great deal of, of energy in the infrared. Um, and, and those stars are of interest for, uh, for other reasons, because those stars tend to be quite small and thus very long-lived. Stars that are quite small and uh, in terms of mass, um, they, they take a very long time to use up all of their materials, so they can last billions and trillions of years, depending on the, on the, uh, the overall mass of these stars. So they're interesting from the perspective of looking for life, because if we can identify planets around stars like this, then there's a very, very uh, good chance that they will have had or will continue to have time for, for life to evolve on, on planets that may be around them. So this study originally found three uh, planets around this particular uh, star, which they're now basically just calling Trappist-1. Um, so uh, they found three, and then they did a follow-up study. On this, they used some Spitzer data, some some, some observations from the Spitzer Space Base Telescope, 
Uh, and uh, based on that data, they actually confirmed um, up to seven planets right now around this, this star. Now, lots of planets around the star is in and of itself not Earth-shattering. We have found other stars that host quite a few bodies in the past, although this, this is pretty you know, incredible that it's seven. But what is incredible about this is that all of these stars are around the mass of Earth. They're either just a little bit more or in some cases a little bit less. Now, to, have, to say that, to, to, to say that sentence only three years ago would have been mind-blowing. I remember on the podcast talking about how quickly uh, these, these methods are evolving and how our instrumentation is improving so much that, that uh, we may well get to the point soon that we can find on a regular basis you know, uh, planets perhaps a little bit bigger than Earth. Well, in this case, we've got seven in one system. So Ed mentioned that a few of the planets, there's about three of them that are, that are, that are in this discovery, are actually within that so-called Goldilocks zone. And it's a, it's a hard... I mean, it's an easy thing to communicate to, to people reading stories because the Goldilocks zone, people get it. They kind of relate it back to the, the three bears and the, you know, the, 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 area, the, the porridges are neither too hot or too cold. It is it's just right. And, and this is what the, the Goldilocks zone is referring to. And, of course, that zone changes depending on the, on the mass of the star. So uh, a very low mass star will tend to have that, that, uh, that zone much, much closer to it. And this is the area, typically what they're referring to is the area uh, uh, within which liquid water can exist. And that's why you know, we call it this, this you know, Goldilocks liquid zone. Or on the surface zone. of the planet. So Correct. It could be a subsurface ocean. It is, however, only an indication of temperatures that are likely to be uh, occurring on the planets in this zone. There's so many other factors that, that affect whether or not liquid water can exist on a planet. So we don't know that there's liquid water on the planet. We don't know if they've got atmospheres. Correct. So, you know, in order for liquid water to exist in its liquid state, uh, it needs an atmosphere uh, on a planetary body, I should say, because otherwise it will sublimate straight from ice to gas. It doesn't sit in that liquid state in between. So, you know, we look at uh, the, the centigrade scale in, in, uh, on Earth, um, and this scale is based around the boiling point and freezing point of water at sea level under certain atmospheric pressures. That's because, you know, there's this relationship between pressure and the existence of water, and this is something that actually affects people who climb, you know, really tall mountains a lot, because they can actually you know, have water boiling at much lower, lower temperatures and it can go straight to gas because the atmospheric pressure is so much less. So what we do know at this stage is simply that these planets exist and that several of them are certainly well within this, this Goldilocks zone of uh, their parent star. The parent star being um, uh, quite a small star, and, and when, just to get your head around this, the, the, the size of this star is really quite small. It's very low mass. It's, it's, only, um, uh, not, it's not a great deal um, larger in size than Jupiter. Its mass is quite a lot more than Jupiter, but um, because there's a, you know, a different densities involved in this sort of thing, Jupiter you know, is voluminous mm. but doesn't have a, a huge mass compared to this. But um, uh, that's a really small star. Even to discover a star like that only 10, 15 years ago was, was quite an achievement in and, in and of itself. So there will be, you know, for sure, a lot of follow-up studies oh, about yeah. this. Um, but uh, I, I think one of the, the most exciting things really about this is it is close. You know, it's okay. less than 40 light years away. And on cosmic scale, that is really, really close. So can we get there in the time Trump is going to remain in power? <laughs> Absolutely not. There is no way that Trump well, can ruin this for all of us. To be fair, um, he may be planning to stay around a lot longer. <laughs> Maybe. He might, be the, he might be a Trump boss by the, by the time. And, uh, and like future armor, maybe his head will be in a jar at some point. It'll be advising. Oh, God, I shudder to think of yeah. that. <laughs> move on, move on. Move along, move along. Uh, but no, I mean, 40, 40 light years. We, we, we simply have no way of getting to our closest stellar neighborhood, which, you know, if you look at the Centauri system, Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, and, and its cousins, um, this is only four, four and a half light years away. And we can't get there yet either. And, we're, and there's been, you know, we discussed on the show recently about um, some proposals from various uh, fairly um, uh, prominent uh, physicists and so forth of ways that we might send sort of probes or you know little micro probes or something towards those stars but one of the biggest problems you have with sending anything towards one of these stars is in order to do it within the lifetime of the scientists involved in the project you have to do it at such significant speeds that even if you can accelerate to those speeds and there's different ways that we might actually be able to do that with today's technology you can't stop when you get there and this is you know we saw this with uh 
um, Pluto. with Pluto, yeah, with um, New Horizons, New Horizons uh, probe. You know, it, it was, it is now the fastest thing that we've 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 ever accelerated, um, and uh, yeah, it was a very very quick flyby. Still, an enormous amount of data and you know, amazing, but. Um, and you know you could mount, you, they're certainly worthwhile doing it, but you wouldn't be able to stick around in the neighbourhood. That's that's the thing. You also have the problem of once you get there and you get the data, you've got to send that. You've got to send it back. Well. So there's Absolutely. another forty years at light speed. And if you were powerful enough transmitter, and and then of course you also have to overcome the 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 travelling away from you speed of the probes. Yep. That gets multiplied into the equation of sending the, the information back at the speed of light as well. Yep. Unless we finally come up with subspace communications. Come on. <laughs> what are you doing? We can't get an NBN, but let's That's true. It's very true. So, uh, yeah, look, this was all over uh, news outlets. It was in, in mainstream news. And, and generally speaking, although, I mean, there was a lot of um, uh, we're so close to finding life sort of headlines mm. and we expect that sort of clickbaity nature of things, I have to say I wasn't really too upset by a lot of the coverage in mainstream. Right. It was actually quite well good. done. And this is something that's been a long, you know, long term ongoing theme in this in this show that we, we often have a look and we, we're quite critical of the manner in which mainstream media in particular will report upon science. And this they did a relatively good job with this. But I think, you know, it was it was well orchestrated. NASA did a very good job with their with their conference. They they built some tension. They didn't do it too far in advance. There wasn't any alternate life possibility scenarios here as there's bit them in the past. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it was well handled. But, yeah, still very, very exciting. And in terms of life, it is a fairly young star, though. So it's, I think it's only 500 million years old. Does that sound right? Uh, I'm not actually sure, uh, okay. to, to be honest, of, the, of the, um, how old the star itself is. So if that's true, I mean, we think Earth start, uh, life started on Earth around about half a billion years uh, into it. So 500 million years, it's possible that there could be some very fledgling you know, basis for life. Everything we find, like every time we find uh, evidence on Earth uh, from, from, you know, that's been untouched for longer. I mean, we just had another story, which I don't think we are covering today, but the, the other story of the um, life... Uh, evidence of life that was trapped in crystals in a cave, oh, yes. which was a, a really great story, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell you about it now. Um, <laughs> Maybe but, next uh, time. <laughs> but, you know, there, there are things that um, we keep finding more, and it's hard on Earth because um, because it's a, a geologically active mm. uh, body and has been right throughout its life, is, is the evidence keeps getting, you know, buried. I was going to say co- covered up, which was just so appropriate for the skipper <laughs> camp. But, um, uh, so the, with the ev- evidence getting buried, it's really, really difficult to find stuff that's really old on Earth. Um, but but we keep finding things that are older and older, and we mm. keep having to recalibrate um, when we believe Earth uh, uh, when life first began on Earth. And it, it may well be that it got started many times over and over again, mm. and mm. was wiped out by events, and then then kick started. So we don't know yet how long it takes for for life to to begin. Very good. Well, let's move on to some cancer research and look at Dr. Patrick Soon Xiong, the world's richest doctor and person who can't do a Vulcan salute very well. <laughs> he has an estimated net worth of $9 billion, much of which was made from the sale of pharmaceutical startups. Uh, he's met with President Donald Trump at least twice since the election. Last year, he launched Cancer Moonshot 2020 a coalition of a number of drug and biotech companies working on cancer treatments and personalised medicine. So, Joe, we're a year later. How's it looking? Not good. <laughs> All right. So, um... <laughs> so, yes, as you say, Ed, um, Dr. Patrick Soon Xiong um, is a, uh, a surgeon. Um, and as you say, he is uh, considered to be the world's richest doctor. He's also considered to be the richest person in Los Angeles, which is impressive. Um, so he has been involved for a long time now in a lot of um, very um, busy startup companies, and um, he's got a, a wide range of business interests. And in January of last year, this cancer moonshot was announced. Now, um, you may all remember another cancer moonshot being announced around the same time, and this is because um, Joe Biden um, announced a federal cancer moonshot, and it's actually was seen as rather controversial that um, this uh, this other 
um, initiative was announced simultaneously. Um, now, the, as you say, um, the, 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 the moonshot is essentially, as, as, as everyone would know, the idea of a moonshot is you are literally aiming to achieve something that people see as being unattainable, often in a, a, a relatively uh, rapid period of time. And um, the, the, the way they describe this initiative is that this unprecedented collaboration of multinational pharmaceutical, biotechnology companies, academic centres and community oncologists will make possible access to over 60 novel and approved agents under exploration in the war against cancer and will enable rapid testing of novel immunotherapy combination protocols forming the basis of the Cancer Moonshot 2020. Now, the mission of the program is to rapidly enrol and complete phase two clinical trials. Um, phase two trials and all that. Uh, is everyone familiar with the different phases of, of uh, clinical trials? No? I'm so, so, so tempted to quote uh, Dr. Evil. I, I don't know. If, I'm not good with phase. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so phase one uh, trials are usually designed to assess um, safety. Um, and then phase two trials are normally done um, in a small number of patients to test the efficacy of a drug. And then phase three trials are normally done on a much larger scale with large groups of patients and uh, look at um, sort of broader efficacy and, uh, and other um, uh, issues around the effectiveness of, of the drug. Um, they, they can be a little bit different um, in non-drug trials, so radiotherapy trials and so on. Um, but essentially, so yes, the mission of the Cancer Moonshot program is to rapidly enroll and complete randomized phase two clinical trials to validate the potential of panomic, that is whole genome, transcriptome, and proteomic analyses, and to evaluate novel combination immunotherapies as the next generation standard of care. And as you would have heard us discuss previously on Science on Top, immunotherapy is the big buzzword in, um, in oncology right now. Um, enhancing the immune system to treat cancer is really seen as a very exciting development in, in the war on cancer. Um, now, the, the approach that this Moonshot program is taking is a, a multi-pronged approach. What they're looking at doing is getting um, pharma and biotech companies to contribute their novel agents um, to allow combinations of therapies. Because one of the things about immunotherapy approaches is that it's unlikely to be effective in a single approach. Um, it's likely that you'll need to use different combinations of therapies working together um, to, to harness different parts of the immune system and potentially also using other established oncology treatments um, to, to target um, the, the cancer in different ways. Um, the other aspect of this is the National Immunotherapy Coalition, and this would be to design, initiate, and complete the randomized controlled trials in cancer patients with cancer at all stages of the disease in up to 20 tumor types. And what they're aiming to do is to treat within these protocols as many as 20,000 patients by 2020, which is a very large number to be able to assess the effectiveness of these um, techniques. Another uh, side of it is something that they call QUILT, which is Quantitative Integrative Lifelong Trial. And they describe this as being stratified across multiple phase one and phase two trials. And it would address up to 20 different tumor types, including breast, lung, prostate, ovarian, and so on. Um, I suppose what's quite interesting there also is we don't yet know exactly how effective immunotherapy is going to be in different tumor types. They, we've got a pretty good idea that um, immunotherapy uh, has been shown to be pretty effective in melanoma um, and lung, but uh, there are a lot of other cancer subtypes where they're still doing early research into knowing how effective it'll be in these different streams. Um, Soon Xiong was quoted as saying, uh, the Cancer Moonshot Program, the National Immunotherapy Coalition and the Quilt Program are designed to do just that, bring together a diverse group of visionary leaders and stakeholders to pull resources and bring to patients a dramatic improvement in cancer care. Now, this all sounds really exciting. What could be better than bringing together um, all of these initiatives, working together? One of the biggest problems in, um, in medical research, and I'm sure in other fields as well, is that silo effect where companies and specialists and so on are, um, you know, are working separately rather than working together. Obviously, there's a lot of you know, business competitiveness and so on. Um, and... Sadly, as wonderful as this all sounds, I think what's being shown by uh, the, the sort of uh, being shown by people who are looking more closely at what is being promised by Sun Xiong 
is that this all sounds a little bit too good to be true. And the, the reason that this has come about is because, I don't know if you're familiar with the publication Stat, um, Stat News do some really fantastic um, investigative uh, journalism around the uh, medical and science arena and technology. I highly recommend uh, reading their articles if you can. Um, and they've looked very closely at Sun Xiong's claims. And they found that the initiative, rather than um, being the grand uh, scheme that will uh, win the war on cancer, um, it appears more likely to be, as they describe it, an elaborate marketing tool for Sun Xiong, a way to promote his new cancer diagnostic tool. Um, apparently, some of his businesses are doing rather poorly, and they see that it may actually be that this, um, this whole initiative may be a way for him to actually uh, in, in improve his business outlook. Um, uh, and there are a, a number of the claims that are being made about what, what has been achieved thus far and what they hope to achieve that are quite wildly inflated. Uh, a hematologist uh, who, who was quoted in the stat article said that the clinical breakthroughs touted by Patrick Soon Xiong are less than modest. They are the most minuscule and vague findings. Uh, he called them overblown beyond what is reasonable or fair. Um, now, some of the problems that they found were that they are aggressively promoting this expensive diagnostic tool, uh, which they call GPS cancer. Um, that this tool essentially analyzes a patient's tumors um, and recommends a course of treatment. Now, you've probably heard the, the term personalized medicine thrown around a lot over the years. And really, yes, absolutely, we do see in the future that being able to um, analyze the, the makeup of an individual patient's tumor in terms of the genetic and the molecular makeup um, will really help us to design treatments that are going to be specialized to that patient. You know, you, you would have heard about things like the, the BRCA gene in uh, breast and prostate cancer. Um, there are genes that are specifically found in certain types of brain tumors. And absolutely, if we can identify um, what an individual patient's tumor is going to best respond be, res, is going to best respond to, then we can provide them with more effective treatments. But essentially, um, it seems like this GPS cancer has not actually been validated uh, in in good. Uh, well-designed studies as yet and a lot of what um, Sun Xiong is promoting under the banner of the moonshot um, is that he has paid for researchers to use GPS cancer in their work but as I said it's not yet been validated as an effective diagnostic test so the moonshot is is promoting a lot of successes but ultimately all they've done is get a lot of people to use this tool. Uh, they have also claimed extraordinary progress in the first year. Um, uh, they, but Stack found that of the 23 federally listed trials, 13 were actually launched up to 10 years before the moonshot started, and 10 had been completed before the moonshot had even launched. Uh, they also claim that Pfizer, Merck, and Johns Hopkins are involved in the project, but when asked, none of them actually knew of their involvement. <laughs> Um, and there's also wow. um, a lot of criticism around the claim of achieving a universal cancer vaccine by 2020. As I've said, the personalized medicine approach is very promising, but to date, not even a handful of the approved treatment cancer vaccines are on the market. There's maybe one or two that are actually out there. And they are registered for use in a very narrow subset of patients and with very mixed results. Um, the, the thing about immunotherapy, as exciting as it is, is that it presents a lot of challenges. There have been patient deaths in clinical trials. There's been, there was a recent trial um, which um, tested one of the immunotherapy treatments in melanoma patients. Now, what's quite interesting about melanoma is that when, you know, when, it, when it is caught early, it can uh, be very effectively treated. And a, a recent trial looked at using one of these immunotherapy um, treatments um, in melanoma patients who effectively had a very, very good prognosis and a number of patients on that trial died. Now, this is, uh, you know, uh, an uncomfortable thing to say, but, you know, when you are trying these kinds of drugs and treatments in patients whose um, length of life is likely to be very, very short, um, having, uh, having deaths within those trials is more expected, um, whereas when you've got people who have got a very long expectation of life and you've got patients dying from the treatments themselves, that is a major, major problem. 
Um, there's also very debilitating toxicity associated with a lot of these treatments um, and, you know, limited application in terms of the patient groups. Going on beyond that are the financial conflicts of interest which Stapp described. They've essentially said that the Moonshot Initiative looks less like a diverse coalition than a roll call of Soon Xiong's tangled web of business interests. Um, the initiative, they've said, is not a separate legal <coughs> entity. It's tied to his group of companies. Um, the five biotech companies that are participating in the Moonshot are the only ones that are sponsoring the trials that are registered under this quilt banner. And they're all closely tied to Soon Xiong. He's either the CEO, a board member, or the controlling owner in each of them. Um, and only two major drug companies have joined the coalition, Amgen and Celgene, very you know, well-known big pharmaceutical companies, and Sun Xiong is a shareholder in both of them, and both of them are investors in his companies. So the picture is very, very murky, mm. and I think that it's really important that people really exercise caution when uh, kind of jumping on to the exciting claims made by someone like this who, you know, ultimately you know is quite credible but really when you when you talk to experts in the field you can see that um the the, the claims are not all all they are cracked up to be um it, it's that thing of making big promises that only you seem to think you can achieve kind exactly. of thing whereas exactly. the rest of the community is saying hold on that's a bit extreme uh and this this guy he's got a, a reputation of a lot of bluster a lot of self-aggrandizing much like a certain current president, uh, where he will say big things about how we're going to do something really big. Proof is always in the pudding, and we're only a year into it, but he's promising to do these big things by 2020, and we're running out of time to see them. So Absolutely, and I think it's, it's very dangerous to make those sorts of wild claims, and I think I, I suppose one of the things that comes out when you get these sorts of things thrown out there is you'll often get a lot of people who will throw money at you, which mm. is usually exactly what you're wanting to achieve. Um, but just on the other side of that, Ed, I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, there was another cancer moonshot that was announced at the same time as this one. Um, and uh, Joe Biden uh, was, was very much behind that. And I, I don't know if you're aware, Joe Biden lost his son to cancer and he had a, a very strong interest in seeing this succeed. And the other cancer moonshot um, is being run through the NIH, uh, the National Cancer Institute through the NIH in America. And they are very transparent in what they've achieved. And you can go onto their website and actually see uh, between January last year when it was announced and where they are today, they've got a very clear listing of, their, of, of the advances that they've made. And they're the sorts of things that you would be wanting to see and expecting to see. They are um, exciting, but they're also realistic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I put my money behind something like that rather than something so wildly um, out there. Also, I think they are actually suing Patrick Soon. They for, are. For using the cancer moonshot terminology, which they started using a long time ago. That is so. correct. That is correct. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move back to some astronomy stories. And for the first time, astronomers have observed the immediate aftermath of a supernova detecting it just three hours after it exploded. 160 million years plus three hours. Uh, previously, we'd have considered it very lucky to see a supernova even a few days after occurring, or by the time the light gets here, obviously. Uh, so this is a pretty big discovery. Yeah, this was an interesting one that sort of hit the news because um, the study had been published only recently, even though the, the event that had been observed was back in 2013, so it was, it was quite a while ago. But as you say, we, what was very... Um, uh, what stood out with this particular observation was that they managed to get instruments onto this supernova so, so quickly after it was first noticed. In fact, only three hours after it was noted in the sky did the, um, did the word get out. And then within six hours, there were instruments pointing at it. And that's pretty, that's pretty amazing, in, in, like even today, because mm. telescopes um, and, and other instruments have immensely long times where they're, they're, basically they have schedules and, and time frames. And you have to bid for time, and a lot of your grant uh, uh, time is spent on, on, on getting telescope time. So these are basically public resources, or there's, there's private ones as well, but all of them... Um, you know, you have to bid for time to use them. So to get um, quite a number of different instruments onto this thing within such a short time frame is, uh, is, is both an achievement, but also 
horrible for people <laughs> whose who's, you know, uh, postgraduate degree or whatever yeah. is, is, uh, is, is hinging upon some uh, telescope time that they booked you know, two and a half years ago, um, which they don't get. It's just gone. some star it's not like 160 they, million years away. It. They don't, <laughs> they don't get to sort of, oh, we'll just take you on at the end. I'm sorry, it's gone. You apply again. Um, you, you get so... It's uh, it's a little bit sad for them. However, you know it, it's a it's a, an an amazing event to, to capture. If you're not aware, we, most of what we know about supernovae is is um, is based upon the remnants that they leave behind, which is usually these what, what for a long time have been called planetary nebula. Um, these are uh, things like uh, if you've ever had the good fortune to look through a telescope at. Perhaps Orion's Belt is a, is a great example of a, of a gorgeous nebula that's that's very easily seen, even with a, a, a relatively decent um, zoom lens on a camera. You can you can pick up the, the the Orion Nebula, which is which is gorgeous. There are many many others out there, and if you do ever have an opportunity to go to like the um, uh, one of the ASV events, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, where, where we live, and uh, there are other ones around Australia and certainly around the world, you can go to Dark dark sky sites and you can look at just mind-blowing things with telescopes that you think, how the hell do they get these things out here into the bush because they're, they're massive. But these planetary nebula are, are basically the remnants of a, of a stellar explosion. So if a star that is big enough to, to go through that supernova phase um, explodes, then it, it ends up leaving this beautiful pattern of, of these uh, often um, uh, lit up uh, a luminous uh, a gas which is all of the stuff that, that basically gets affected by the shock wave from the, um, uh, from the supernova. So what we know about them is based on backtracking these things, you know, trying to wind back the clock and see, well, if we bring all this stuff back in, you know, what are the final moments of this star? And, and the final moments of a star, they go through, this type of star goes through a red supergiant phase. And that phase is actually quite a short period of its, of its total, um, total life. Very, very short, uh, you know, like less than single digit percentages of its life. Um, so it is actually quite rare to see stars in this part of their life. Now, this star, because this is, you know, we're talking about modern era where we've done many, many star surveys, um, we, we do have imaging and spectra and all sorts of stuff from this star before it went supernova, which is awesome because we don't usually get that. Um, but not only do we have that, we've got these things from six hours after it was first noticed, um, which is also mind-blowingly cool because it helps us check the theories and the models and all the things that we use to, to, um, to build up the, what we know about supernova. I've seen it described as it's like looking... What we normally get is if you look at the shell of a smouldering, bombed-out building versus this, which is like a few seconds after the bomb exploding and you see the shock wave sort of hitting other buildings and stuff. So you can actually see in much more detail what is actually happening. Yeah. And if you, I mean, just if you, if you try and think what this event is like, if you've ever seen Mythbusters with some of their, certainly in the latest seasons where they just, it was all about blowing just stuff blowing up. Things up. Um, yeah. they, they often had these, this incredible, you know, ultra high speed film, film, you know, digital uh, video of, of, uh, of things being blown up. You see that shot wave going out. And that's basically what, you know, causes that, that luminosity of these clouds. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's not, uh, as yet, there's not a, there'll be data coming out of this for quite some time, is, is basically the, the upshot of it. Um, but uh, it, it is notable simply because it's, uh, it's just added a fairly significant piece of, uh, to the puzzle in, in terms of our overall understanding of, of the processes that lead up to a supernova event, which is, which is very cool. Cool. And Joe? The first comprehensive assessment of Europe's crickets and grasshoppers has found that more than a quarter of species are being driven to extinction. So we're losing a lot of crickets and grasshoppers at the same time that we're getting a lot of uh, experts, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, saying we should start looking to a diet of crickets and insects <laughs> and grasshoppers rather than relying on great big cows. Uh, this is pretty dramatic. Yep. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> and that's... We don't collaborate on the script before we no. do this. Hang on, hey, well, there's a script? <laughs> that's why oh, I didn't work. <laughs> I muted it before. Uh -huh. You, oh, had, you had an audio-visual I had an audio, yes. 
Oh, yeah, it's yeah. launching. It's not working. No, is it the, 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 it's muted on YouTube. I'm going to be very disappointed if it's the sound of crickets. Uh, is, it, is that what it is, Joe? Yeah. Is it the sound of crickets? <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Bear is unamused. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> this is not helping Graham. He usually goes to sleep and listens to the podcast. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that's one of my favourite sounds. Ah, and... Graham going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, essentially, uh, the according to the International Union for Conservation of Nature... Of all the threatened insect groups um, in, assessed so far in Europe, crickets are the most threatened, and they expect that if we don't act now, um, crickets will no longer be with us. Um, now, so more threatened than bees, because we hear a lot about the disappearing bees. Well, I'm not sure whether more so than bees, but, cert- but certainly what they say of the of those assessed so far in Europe, okay. they are the most threatened. Um, essentially, the the group known as Orthoptera. So crickets, bush crickets and grasshoppers um, live on grassland and of course um, a lot of the habitat um, is, is being uh, destroyed and uh, the problem of, you know, from, sorry, let me start again. The problem with this is that like a lot of the problems we're seeing with climate change, the loss of these uh, species has flow on effects. Um, crickets are, are an important food source for birds and reptiles, and it could result in uh, major effects on a lot of these ecosystems. Now, as, as Ed mentioned, something that we've been hearing um, over the last few years is that in the future, as uh, human food sources are threatened with climate change, um, insects could become a very important source of protein for humans. Now, that is quite concerning because a potential future food source could be lost there as well. In fact, uh, James was just telling me earlier, next year's Skeptic Camp, the food is all going to be crickets and grasshoppers. So, uh, I actually that. quite enjoyed the, the uh, trial of that uh, today. Did you, did you all get one of the grasshopper sandwiches? They were yeah, really, yeah. really young. Really, it looked really like really turkey, curious. but it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, essentially, the, um, the, the, the chair of the conservation subcommittee and the lead author of the report um, uh, highlighted the fact that th- this represents a, a major concern in terms of loss of diversity and these um, insects uh, like crickets and bush crickets are very good indicators of biodiversity in these ecosystems. Um, they're particularly concerned about species within small ranges such as uh, the crow plain grasshopper which lives in the crow plain in the south of France. There's probably a lovely French pronunciation of that which I have probably butchered. Um, but I, so I actually thought you said the crowd playing grasshopper. It's like that's the, what I said. It's yes. like the, the yes. insect world version of Coldplay or something. They not, just, not the crowd. The crowd. The, the crowd. <laughs> no, I see that. Yeah, I've got this image. I've certainly got this image of a whole lot of crickets at a rock concert crowd. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, one, one of the, the events that is concerning is wildfires and of course as we see with uh, increasing uh, significant weather events, uh, wildfire, wildfires could play a major risk also in the loss of these species. And of course there's just the lovely sound of crickets. I must admit, when I saw this story I didn't sort of get the importance of it straight away mm. because the only thing I've really, really been aware of with crickets and grasshoppers and so forth is, is locust plates. Like mm-hmm. a, yeah. a, a, a yeah. plague? No, that's not the right word. Uh, um, no. It is it a plague? Is. Yeah, a swarm. A swarm, whatever. So, you know, and, and there was just a couple of years ago, I think there was a, uh, a real concern in, in rural Victoria, Western Victoria, mm-hmm. about this, uh, this great hatching of uh, events of, of grasshoppers that I thought were going to wipe out all of crops all over Victoria. I don't think it actually happened in the end. No, I don't, I don't know. Did. But if you watch David Attenborough's latest Planet Earth 2, uh, I think the episode on grasslands has, they actually film a plague of a billion locusts swarming and just decimating huge parts of Madagascar. And it is a phenomenal thing to watch because it only happens for a, a few months or so and then the, all the food is gone, they die and huge amount of uh, crops have been lost yeah. before a few years later they hatch again and come out and wipe it out. But I think, I think what that raises also is the way these different species can represent very different things in different parts of the world. Mm. And, and one of the things that actually makes me think of is, I don't know if you remember the HSBC ads, 
um, which essentially have actually been about um, the issues around cultural intelligence. But um, there's a great one which talks about um, the cricket, um, which in the USA is considered a pest. In China, it's considered a pet. And in Northern Thailand, it's considered an appetizer. <laughs> um, so great use there. It's different areas. But again, I don't know about all of you, the sound of cicadas to me represents such a, a lovely no, part of Australian I don't experience. I sort of hear it much anymore. I, I know that I don't. Yeah, but the sound of cicadas used to be, for me, such a, a, a lovely sort of sound of yeah. Australian summer. I don't notice that anymore. I very rarely re remember actually hearing the sound of cicadas or even seeing the shells, and I don't know what that's down to, whether it's just, mm. you know, I know I know that they don't always come out every year. But yeah, the cyclical. We, we, yeah. This year we went, oh, sorry, last year now, we went camping up at Upper Yarra Reservoir, which mm. if you've not been up there, it's a beautiful part of the country, and we were camping up there, and we were there just during this cicada event. But... It was it, it was really over about three days, and they were kind of they'd start cropping up in different areas, but disappearing where we'd heard them at initially. But uh, yeah, I agree, it's a beautiful sound. Mm. But uh, sure, yeah, more more concerning for the well, think of the animals. Right? Think of the animals. Yeah. Well, essentially, though, the, the you know, like with so many things around um, you know climate change and the the risk management that you mentioned earlier. Um, I'm, of course, this is a podcast, and so no one knows who I'm gesturing to. <laughs> But, um, you know, they're talking about the fact that um, habitat management and good ecology, uh, good eco ecological management is going to be key in, uh, in mitigating for these events. So hopefully the, you know, the right people who can um, take action on this will be doing so. Did the study actually go into uh, causes for this or...? Well, um, as I said, so, oh, okay. so some of it, a lot of it was around um, climate change. Um, they talked about wild flat, wildfires, um, intensive agriculture practices, and also tourism development. And, mm. uh, you know, of course... Human activity. Human activity, very yeah. much. So, the usual yeah. story. Absolutely. All right, now, we did discuss beforehand that we were going to open up to questions after each story, and then I completely forgot because I'm a terrible host... So I, I just thought you'd made a unilateral decision <laughs> to not do We're doing this. it this way. <laughs> but did anyone have any questions about any of the things that we've talked about so far up the back there? Yeah, just on the first topic, uh, we've got so many extra planets now. Is there going to be a prize, perhaps a chocolate frog, for the first extra moon? The first exo moon. Is there, so the question was: Is there going to be a prize for discovering the first exo moon? I'm sure there will be a prize of of uh, awesome uh, um, uh, love from from colleagues and a little bit of jealousy. Uh, but if you personally do it, I will get you a prize. <laughs> <laughs> Who will be a chocolate frog? It might be. We will see. Chocolate cricket. <laughs> Richard. Um, yeah, just on the back to the same story about these new exoplanets. Um, the fact that these planets are so close to a star, in fact, they're as close as, um, I think, Jupiter's moons are to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. um, because they're so close, that means that they're going to be tied and locked, which means that one side always faces the star. That's mm -hmm. what we're saying. Does that mean in terms of looking for life? You know, we're talking about you know, liquid water. Well, you know, one side's going to be burning hot, the other side's yeah. going to be freezing cold. What's that going to do to the chance for liquid water and also what's, what's it going to do to uh, stability of the atmosphere, you know, massive convection currents, massive storms um, and, I don't know, boiling off the water into uh, space. Would they even have an atmosphere? So what's yeah. that going to do to this whole... That's a really, system? really great question because uh, you're quite right. They uh, all, it, it, At least four or five of these, they, I think they were saying, are very likely to be tidally locked. And it's just like our moon, it always shows the same face to, to Earth, so we, we don't see the far side of the moon, which is not the dark side of the moon, because it's not dark. Oh, it is sometimes. But, um, but yeah, you're quite right. So the, the, um, there's a lot of theories about how life may cope with such an environment. It's uh, thought that if the um, planet does have a fairly thick atmosphere, then the atmosphere may itself be able to carry heat and energy around the planet and, and be able to distribute it. If the atmosphere is not particularly large, then it may well be that there's, a, there's in fact a habitable zone on the planet itself, which might be a ring. Sort of if you think of the, the, uh, the zone in between sunrise and sunset, this sort of this area where it's not too hot, not too cold, kind of that Goldilocks zone on the planet. It may well be that this is where life can evolve. So this is where studies of things like um, the uh, extremophiles on Earth give us some signposts to what might be possible on 
on planets such as this because we see life everywhere on Earth. Pretty much the the most absurd places that you would never think would support life. I mentioned these crystal caves Mm. just earlier on. There are are types of life uh, that evolve in in, in, um, thermal vents, in in, deep deep sea trenches. There are types of life that that manage to uh, stay alive in in, uh, frozen glacier sort of uh, uh, environments. At the back of my fridge. At the (laughs) back of my fridge. So uh, there's, there's a, an amazing diversity in the conditions that life can potentially uh, live. So the answer to the question is, yes, all of those things, and we just don't know yet. And one of the things that we need to do is, is in follow-up studies is to start looking at the spectra of the planets themselves. And we're really lucky with this particular one. These planets, having been discovered with that transit method by the dimming of the star as they moved in front, gives us the opportunity to collect spectra from the atmospheres, if there are any, of the planets themselves. Because as they go in front of the star, we can actually see the sun's light or the star's light going through the atmosphere of the star and then we can measure the change in the spectra of that light and that gives us markers for what um, the, the atmosphere, if there is one, actually contains because of these absorption lines in, in spectra. So it's Did really... James Webb will do that work? James Webb is one... Well, James Webb won't be observing the spectra per se. It will a little bit because it's, it's mainly an infrared. Um, a telescope, so it will give us part of the equation, but there's a whole lot of other uh, instruments that, that even now are able, able to do a lot of this work. And as I mentioned before, the fact that it is only 40 light years away in cosmic terms does give us a few more tools that we can use than we may have if it was much, much further away. But um, will we know if there's life there in our lifetime, I think is another, is, is another question, and I think it's a little bit um, all we will know for sure in our lifetime and I think this is highly likely, is whether or not there are things like oxygen, atmospheric oxygen around any of these planets. And oxygen and methane are very good indicators, um, and some other gases as well are are quite good indicators of of life, particularly oxygen. Oxygen tends not to want to hang around by itself for very long. It wants to bind with things. And as a result, it tends not to be in a planet's atmosphere through processes other than life. Though, but of course those are the signs of the types of life we would Correct. be familiar yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. There may be other, other. other you know, forms of life that we may not even know to look for yeah. or, to, or, or what the signals would be for them and <laughs> yeah. therefore we may not... Absolutely. And, and again, you know, we can only base it upon what we know, which is what we've observed on, on Earth. Yeah. And, and certainly, um, you know, based on the, the uh, sample size of one, mm. we know that, that oxygen, you know, is, is something that's a really good indicator for. So if you're going to look for anything, look for the thing that you know will be caused by life as we know mm. it. And, and oxygen is, is one of those things. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. And as always, if you want any more information about these stories, check out scienceontop.com slash 256. You can leave a comment, a review or on iTunes, or get in touch on social media. And don't forget, scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help us out financially. Thanks for joining me today, Joe and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. This episode was edited with Dashing Good Looks by Marcos Benamu. And thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs> we'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. The discovery gives us a hint that finding a second Earth is not just a matter of if, but when. Scientists believe, actually, that around every star there could be one planet. Take three, take five, take seven. And you can just imagine how many worlds are out there that have a shot to becoming a habitable ecosystem that we could explore. And what we really have in this story is a major step forward towards answering one of these very questions that are at the heart of so many of our philosophers of what we're thinking about when we're by ourselves. And that basically is, are we alone out there?